want to play with exposed cards. If I had to award a prize for the best idea anyone has ever had, I would give it to Darwin before Newton, Einstein, or anyone else. The idea of evolution by natural selection unites in one fell swoop the realm of life with the realm of space and time, causality, mechanisms, and physical laws. But it's not just a wonderful scientific idea. It's also a dangerous idea that lends itself to many easy misunderstandings. Don't believe me? Try to follow me and I'll prove it to you. Since the beginning of time, every human group has asked big questions about the origin of the world and life on Earth. And the answers that have been given over time have been many and varied. Of course, these were not very scientific answers, but rather the result of the social, economic, and cultural conditions of the communities in which they were developed. The story contained in the Bible is known to all. God created the entire universe in just six days, beginning on October 3rd, 4004 BC. According to the 17th century calculations of the Anglican Bishop James Usher, quite apart from the recklessness of the date, this led to the belief that all species of animals and plants, including humans, had been created in a matter of days in the exact form in which we know them today. Today all this seems inconceivable, but it remains a fact that, at least until the 18th century, the dominant idea in the Western world was fixism, according to which species were considered unchangeable. The French naturalist Georges-Louis Leclerc de Buffon was the first to formulate an evolutionary proposal, followed by other scholars. But it was Charles Darwin and the publication of his treatise on the origin of species in 1859 that gave the theory of evolution its definitive shape, supported by the thesis of natural selection, a mechanism that favors the transmission from generation to generation of those genetic traits that are best adapted to the environment, eliminating those that are disadvantageous. According to Darwin, the evolution of species is the result of the combined action of chance and necessity. Within species, there are random natural mutations, small errors in the reproduction of the genetic code, that are either preserved or rejected, depending on whether they prove to be more or less useful in the struggle for survival. A classic example is the short-necked giraffe, which produces offspring with short necks, and by chance some long necks. A long drought occurs grass dries up and the drafts are forced to feed on branches torn from the few surviving trees. Those with short necks cannot reach the branches and perish, while those with long necks somehow survive, reproduce and pass on their genes for long necks to their offspring. Over hundreds of generations, a population of long necked giraffes will stabilize and replace the short necked ones. According to Darwin, the struggle for life, the competition for food resources when they are scarce, is the most important form of environmental selection, but it is not the only one. There is also sexual selection, whereby the strongest and healthiest individuals reproduce more and other forms of environmental selection. In short, the guiding principle of the theory of evolution is quite clear. Living species change over time due to environmental pressures and sexual selection to which they are subjected. A concept that is in itself very simple, almost banal. Precisely for this reason, perhaps, as the philosopher of science David Hull ironically said, almost everyone understands it in the wrong way. However, if we often misunderstand some aspects of evolution, it is not necessarily the fault of creationist propaganda. Many of the mistakes we make are probably due to how our species thinks and communicates. For example, the idea of evolution as progress, which sometimes make us compare organisms to technologies, is very widespread, because we are naturally inclined to attribute a purpose to what surrounds us. That's why in this video, we decided to address the theme of evolution, discussing the most common misunderstandings such as those we propose here below. Evolution tends towards achieving a goal. Wrong. Many see evolution as a long road that begins in the distant past and has a precise goal, namely the birth of our species or other more evolved species. But the process itself, as explained by Charles Darwin and deepened by evolutionists, is based only on the success of behaviors or other adaptations that allow survival in a particular environment and only at particular historical moments. There is no design, only chance and necessity. Evolution legitimizes the law of the strongest. Wrong. It is often said that the evolution justifies aggression and domination because it is a natural law that leads to the survival of the strongest. The concept is absolutely foreign to science. The most fit individuals in a population are not the strongest physically or the most aggressive, but those who reproduce more and better. 
For example, rodents such as hares and rabbits cannot be said to be aggressive or stronger than a predator, yet they are among the most common mammalian species on Earth. And even within a species, it is not a given that selection will eventually favor strength and dominance. On the contrary, the greatest evolutionary success will go to those individuals who can defend themselves with intelligence and pass on their genes to their offspring. Evolution does not explain the missing link. Wrong. The concept of intermediate species or transitional forms is false. The term missing link was coined during the 19th century evolutionary debate to refer to the lack of fossil evidence that would complete the evolutionary lines of living forms. In the 19th century, the discovery of a missing link between humans and so-called inferior animals was expected to provide definitive proof of the theory of evolution. This concept has now largely been overcome, and the theory of the evolution of living things has become more refined abandoning the idea of a linear evolution chain in favor of bush diagrams in which each species and population becomes a transitional form. There are living fossils that have escaped evolution. Wrong. It is just a way of saying that although many forms of life, both animal and plant, are similar to those of the past, this does not mean that they have remained unchanged for millions of years, as if evolution had never begun for them. A well-known example is the coelacanth a fish found in 1938 in the waters off Madagascar, whose most similar form dates back to some 400 million years. But the resemblance to the past is superficial, and those species were very different from those of today. Evolution relies solely on chance. Wrong. Some creationists believe that according to biologists, change in living things is due to chance alone. Indeed, chance plays a large role in evolution, but to say that evolution is a completely random process is incorrect. Yes, DNA mutations are generally defined as random in the sense that the appearance of a particular mutation does not depend on the needs of the individual or the species. But natural selection, as well as sexual selection, is the opposite of random. Adaptation is made possible by this omnipresent filter that modifies the genetic heritage of populations over time. It is not random at all if some of the rare mutations that allow individuals to produce more offspring spread. The entire process of evolution by natural selection involves at least two fundamental steps. The first is the generation of variability through mutations or other changes in the genome, the DNA of an individual. The second is the actual natural selection that eliminates individuals that cannot reproduce in that particular environment. Mutations can be thought of as random. But natural selection is a completely deterministic process, far from random selection. Evolution equals progress. Wrong. It is a fact, evolution is usually described as a slow but inexorable march toward the improvement of species. The false equivalence between evolution and progress reflects a socio-cultural prejudice, not a biological conclusion. And it does not take much intuition to identify the primary source of this prejudice as our human desire to see ourselves as the apex of life's history, the rulers of the earth by right and biological necessity. No matter how advanced our culture has become, we continue to regard other living species, whether plants or animals, as inferior to us in the evolutionary chain. We are convinced that they are present on this earth only to serve us exclusively and to satisfy all our desires and appetites. We thus confuse having appeared late in evolutionary time with a trait of certain improvement, as if we were the last link in a linear path of continuous and unceasing growth of the best and most sophisticated attributes that living beings can manifest. If we could instead see ourselves as what we are, a mere accident of contingency, a phenomenon that has only recently emerged from the many branches of evolution, we might better recognize our vulnerability and perhaps have more respect for all the other life forms that have been around infinitely longer than we have and have endured catastrophes that we would have not been able to survive. Evolution says that man is descended from the ape. Wrong. Man is not descended from the actual apes, nor vice versa. Instead, apes and humans share a common ancestor. In the case of chimpanzees, with which we share much of our genome sequence, the most recent common ancestor is now estimated to have lived between 4 and 8 million years ago. It was certainly distinct from both chimpanzees and humans, and we might even call it an ape if it were not for the fact that, in common parlance, that word implicitly refers to an extant species. Some may not like it, but the reality is that man is not descended from the ape because, more accurately, man is an ape. Evolution is not discernible. Wrong. 
Evolution is said to be slow and gradual, which is why it cannot be observed in action. While it is true that evolution is gradual and that many changes occur on the scale of geologic time scales, there are many cases in which it is possible to observe evolution live or nearly live. Using organisms that reproduce very rapidly, such as bacteria, scientists can observe natural selection and other forces of evolution in the laboratory. Bacterial resistance to antibiotics is perhaps the most immediate example, but all pathogens from insects to fungi rapidly evolve strains that are resistant to all our countermeasures. Even vertebrates can change within a few decades, and we are already seeing adaptations to climate change around the world. Humans have stopped evolving. Wrong. In 2013, the British popularizer David Attenborough claimed that human evolution, at least in the most developed countries, would stop. Medicine and high levels of affluence would eliminate the struggle for survival and, consequently, evolution. It is unclear how such a knowledgeable popularizer could have made such a slip, but biologists were not slow to retort, reaffirming that our species continues to evolve even in societies where almost everyone reaches reproductive age with ease. As long as we continue to choose, i.e. not randomly, whether and with whom to reproduce, and as long as the environment around us continues to change, the DNA of populations will continue to change and evolution will continue. All species are perfectly adapted to their environment. Wrong. How many times while watching a documentary have we heard the narrator say that a certain organism is perfectly adapted to the environment? Certainly the results of natural selection can amaze us, but biologists know that perfection is not a concept applicable to living things. Even the most amazing adaptations are in fact the result of compromises and even genetic design errors. Darwin said that to understand evolution, we should look at rudimentary organs such as the appendix or wisdom teeth in humans, or the rudimentary wings of penguins. These are organs that have become useless and tell us about the past state of things. For example, penguin wings were once used for flight and were shed due to environmental and behavioral changes, leaving only remnants today. Usually, the canonical interpretation that prevailed until some time ago viewed imperfection as an error, a mishap, but it's not like that. Imperfection is inherent in the evolutionary process, and it's good that it exists. It's exactly what we should expect if evolution works as we know it, through random genetic variation and selective processes. Above all, it is important to understand that selection cannot start from scratch every time. There cannot be a tailor-made adaptation to every environmental change, because that would take too much time and energy. So what does nature do? It takes the shortest and most economical route because, otherwise, the alternative is extinction. So it starts with what exists, reuses the available material, modifies it, and transforms it into new functions. It makes a virtue of necessity. Given the situation, the result will not be perfect, but it will be the best possible. Evolution does not explain the origin of life. True. Evolutionary theory, properly updated, can explain the diversity of life on our planet. What it does not explain is the origin of life. How did life begin? The reality is that we still do not know. Scientists generally speak of a biogenesis, or the spontaneous origin of living matter from inorganic substances. On the primordial Earth, natural processes probably led to the chemical compounds that form the basis of life. And over hundreds of millions of years, these would have self-organized into molecular systems, capable of replication and sustaining metabolism, i.e. the earliest forms of life. An alternative hypothesis is that of panspermia, whether life could have originated elsewhere and arrived on Earth through comet and asteroid impacts. Finally, dear friends, more than 160 years after its formulation, the world scientific community is united in its belief that evolution is a scientific fact, supported by a wealth of evidence ranging from anthropology to molecular biology. There is still debate among experts about some of the ways in which evolution works. But there is no question that it is a force that has guided and will continue to guide the development of life on Earth. It is certain sectors of society and public opinion, on the other hand, that continue to deny the scientific validity of evolution, in spite of the abundant empirical evidence that supports it. But why? There are many reasons, but surely one of the most important is that Charles Darwin and all the scientists after him who helped make the theory of evolution a scientific reality completely rewrote the role of the human species in the living world. He brutally knocked Homo sapiens off the pedestal at the center of the living world that he had been sitting on comfortably for thousands of years. And you know, nobody likes to be demoted.